This whole thing is just, he, he seems to think that, God, I remember general conference, that second their first Saturday session, whichever that boring one was where they read off all of the stats and yeah. when you fall asleep and they're always excited to announce how many new members they have. You think they would really turn like, well, okay, now, but we could have millions and millions more, but well, this, we hate black people. <laughs> that's what this subject is. This is, this is a Bednar went to Washington DC and part of what he was doing in Washington DC was bragging about their still growing numbers, even in difficult times. And they asked, where were your growing numbers coming from? And he said, most of our, we, we understand that in Europe and the United States, stuff's leveling off, it's plateauing off. They were, they were honest about that. He says, our growth is in Africa. And so he was bragging about their African growth. And so John- But Delaney they've always done sure. it. They've always bragged about like growing in, in like Brazil or the Philippines or Mexico. Like those are places where they grow rapidly. So this is the, the most racist church, the most racist American church easily is growing most rapidly in Mexico, Brazil, and the Philippines. So they're well, making see, sure to... another example of that, how, how the realities of economics and population actually win this, is that the Brazil Mormon situation was a major piece of ending the black priesthood ban, which was oh, because yeah. the church was enormously successful in Brazil. What part and, of Brazil did you go to, Jerry? Oh, mm. so you weren't too far from my people, but because so, like my you know my dad went to Brazil in the south in the sixties with the ban fully in force, and you know they were mostly talking to Germans and Italians. But my mom and like a story my mom told me was that she went on splits she, as a, just as a, a young convert member, she went on like splits and and the sister missionary would knock on the door and say. Do, do you have any black in your family? And they'd, they'd say no. And she'd go, okay, we're from the Church of Jesus Christ. So like that kind of thing did happen. But then they ran into the problem where they had baptized so many people with African descent that they just had a problem on their hand. Like they couldn't undo all this. And it was obviously ridiculous. And that had a large part to do with the church changing the policy. It was just simply because it was stupid and impractical. Because well, you know, 60% like the... of Brazilians have mixed... African so there, European ancestry. There Wasn't was the a policy. temple something to do with that? Because I, I seem to remember, like, there were a lot of Brazilian Mormons who, like, were... I, I was told the story. They were, like, selling even, like, the gold from their teeth to try to get that temple built in Sao Paulo. And then they... I, I, I'm pretty sure it was built, like, right before the ban was reversed. And I, somebody was yeah. trying to tell me that that might have had something to do with it. Like, well, we have all these members... Who worked so hard to get this temple here and then they they're not gonna be able to use it let's go to wiki temple yeah so not, there was some be. sort of like in mormonism some sort of plessy versus ferguson like one drop of blood type african-american thing like they they signaled out african-american i think that was a brigham young quote he said something about one drop of yeah that that one i'm generally genuinely asking from a place of i i don't remember or know i, I don't know that i even looked at it that hard but i don't know if that was for baptisms or for i mean i know that they did it for for priesthood everybody knows that but that sounds like your mom was avoiding baptizing people but well, no, i mean yeah exactly it was the well it was the missionary because my you know my mom or was, was it maybe just that that missionary numbers thing that you knew that it was going to be a hard sell to the black people. So you moved on to somebody because you're going to be baptized. In well, I think this would have been like late sixties and I, the policy was still fully enforced. And, you know, again, like, and my mom told the story of with the attitude of, she was shocked by it. And also that they weren't all like that. That was kind of, this missionary was a, super zealous on that point. Cause you know, no, it's a system. About, we ought to have my dad come on and do a whole podcast about this topic. Cause my dad, I can't remember which apostle it was. But my dad tells a story about when he was a missionary, and that was back when the apostles would do the mission tours, and that my dad had a private meeting with one of the apostles and confronted him on this issue. Um, you know, so like just there, my dad was in 1966, as a, a Utah white Mormon boy, actively internally and externally questioning the policy. So right there, John DeLynn, like you got to deal with that. Yeah. Does the church have a racist past? Of course. But is it a blanket racist past that they were all just racist? Of course not. It's stupid. Well, they were I, contributing to and benefiting from a racist organization. So, of <laughs> oh, course, they were part yeah. of it. Systems, man. You forget about the systems. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's system. not. It wasn't that individual missionary that was racist. It was. That's part of the, she was the a whole. She was a symptom of a system. 
Yeah, and but, but your dad, but your dad right. being non-racist, being against racism, definitely was not an indicator of the system. Yeah, you, you that's know, the, that's the only thing I want to do. It like I don't know. I mean, we just say it right now, but just the whole like the system made me do it is is the woke equivalent of the devil made me do it. <laughs> well, <laughs> I figured out that if I go off of Sam's free will thing, which is kind of extra systems, <laughs> system systems, no free will. It's all just a systemic thing that becomes part of even like our bodies, our genes, and then everything we've been raised in in the soup. And then I found out what caused it, what caused the racism and what caused the, the problems. It was the Big Bang. The Big Bang <laughs> caused it. Oh, that's <laughs> right. It all goes back to that. The Big Bang was racist. I could probably do that PhD paper. The You're Big up, Bang what? caused racism. You just kind of rewrote... Um a gag from uh hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy i don't remember exactly but like oh yeah i think well, you know it's like the very about, first but, thing yeah, yeah where they say like oh yeah. it, it all it, goes back to this that's <laughs> the big bang happened or in the beginning this happened and most people genuinely think that's a mistake yeah. that it was, that was a mistake yeah something like that yeah that, that was a mistake <laughs> that existence was definitely a mistake <laughs> existence started and most people will agree that was a mistake <laughs> that he's not addressing here but also it's unplowed land. One of the reasons why Africa is booming is because it's not like Mexico. What's Mexico like with the missionaries these days, Gerardo? I mean, when Mormon missionaries- <laughs> Why would Gerardo this part, know? No, it's, this part, Gerardo he know? motions to Gerardo and Gerardo at this part is like, <laughs> like, what do you want me to say? Gerardo's what do you want me to say, like, gringo? I'm the Mexican- No, he, he looks at him for a second. He's, he's seriously trying to get what, like, okay, where's John going with this? What am I supposed to say? And, <laughs> yeah. and then John tells him what he's supposed to say, I'm pretty sure. Gerardo's face right there might be pretty good for a screen capture. What? <laughs> Show up to a- What do you, what do you talk about, John? What you talking about, John? So I just, want to, I just want to point out that, that a rich white man is demanding answers from a gay <laughs> Latino. Yeah, do, do your own emotional labor, John. <laughs> exactly. Do the work, John. <laughs> it's not Gerardo's job to educate you. <laughs> Validate my allyship, Gerardo. They were super racist, right? Pablo <laughs> in Mexico, I said, like, whoa, who are these people? We're just still just trying to get to the money shot, which I think RFM drops. But... What's it like? Um, <laughs> I think it's different in every, in every part, but what I'm just saying that like Latin America, Mexico city was more Mormon than Salt Lake city is It's different <laughs> in every part. That's like, what's I, that's, it's kind of like his whole Africa thing. How he's like, what, what's the church like in Mexico? He's like, kind of like it is in the United States. Mexico probably. city is the second largest population of Mormons for any city who knows if it's the most now. And there's Mormons everywhere there, and it does have this weird feeling that inside the Mormon community that you're just in this huge Mormon world, even though it's Mexico City. Yeah, no, it's just this whole thing. What's it like in Mexico? Mexico is a gigantic country with 2 million people in it, you dork. <laughs> you He's Michael racist. Scott. He's <laughs> I love these. That's one of my favorite parts about The Office is that like, Michael Scott oftentimes like overdoes his, like, I'm... I'm, I'm the ally. Racist. Yeah, and, and to the point where, like, the people are like, dude, just don't stop. <laughs> Look, I'm with the gay guys. Watch me kiss the gay guy. <laughs> I'm going to kiss the gay yeah. guy. And also just the whole thing, like, let's talk about Mexico and racism. Do you know anything about uh, Chivas de la no. Guadalajara? <laughs> the Mexican soccer team that, as a policy, will not hire non-Mexicans? Well, that's, Do you know uh, that's just part of their culture, and it's oh. not... It's not white culture so it's okay well it was probably caused by a white culture oh that's right yeah the it's probably a result of imperialism you, you got to think more systemically sure yeah no that's you're oh wow yeah now you see uh yeah. if i had a Almost penny that. if i had a nickel for every single time when i was in mexico and i had a mexican genuinely ask me what do black people smell like? Do they smell bad? I hear they smell bad. <laughs> <laughs> dead serious. I'm dead serious. Now, here's the thing. If you say they smell great, they smell like malt liquor, fried chicken, and watermelon, things I love. <laughs> yeah. Whenever we start, <laughs> when it, not whenever, but like many times when we start chit-chatting about the States, they talk about, oh, I heard that area's got a lot of black people. I heard there's a lot of black people. I heard they smell bad. Like that generally would just come up. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's one of my favorite Dave Chappelle bits is when he's talking about 
what an odd stereotype to that we like fried chicken like who yeah. doesn't like fried chicken <laughs> that is one of those things where like i mean god going back 20 years ago it was one of my earliest encounters with a woke before i ever knew it was and this was almost 20 years ago and i worked at a cube farm and one of my cube neighbors was a white mormon guy from preston idaho and so he'd only known steak and potatoes his whole life but he was like interested in trying new things and so he talked to me because i'm all about new things and one day i was saying hey there's a new polynesian restaurant that opened up in West Valley. We should check it out on our next adventure. And he says, what's Polynesian food like? And I'm like, well, it's a lot of teriyaki sauce and coconut milk. And the lady three cubes down was, that's a generalization and a racist comment. <laughs> and I'm like, what? What? Like, have you been to a luau? And, <laughs> and what's wrong with teriyaki sauce and coconut milk? Kind of is a generalization, but... Like, that's not, that's like saying, do you like Mexican food? It's like, yeah, they use refried beans. Like, what? Yeah. Mexicans huh. like tacos. What's Italian food like? Well, it's a lot of tomato sauce and pasta. You, generalizing racist. <laughs> I'm, I'm making, yeah, I'm making a generalization. Uh, it's true. Because I think, like, like it's bad, because I get just that. I mean, chitlins. Maybe you could make a joke about that, because that's kind of grody. Although, I mean, I've, I've had pork intestine in Chinese food. It's a lot like tripe. It's not too different from menudo. But like fried chicken is delicious and everybody loves it. And mm -hmm. who doesn't like watermelon? Seriously. And malt liquor, I, I could take or leave. I prefer good beer. I but... only do malt liquor when I'm playing Edward Forty Hands. <laughs> <laughs> you oh, you're the second person in my life who knows about Edward Forty Hands. Ah, uh, I love workaholics, so <laughs> <laughs> Oh, is that, is that what that I never see I never watched that show. It's pretty great. Because I had a friend who that was every birthday he would do Ed, Edward Forty Hands and they would, like I don't know if what it's like in workaholics, but for him they would duct tape two forties, one to each hand, and, <laughs> and he wasn't allowed to have his hands back until he'd emptied the bottles. Yeah, yeah, no, that's how we do. It. My, my friends, I'll have to show it to you. They shot a music video. They did it pretty well, like real professionally, and they got like they got I'll, tons I'll of forties, and they filled up one of my friends' house with a bunch of us who just had duct taped. 40s to our hands. I'll clip oh. it in right here. Also, like, I mean, and just flash from memory of just a, one of the 10 trillion experiences in my life that completely undermines John's position here is I'll never forget when I was in the first grade and like, you know, we were all just sitting around the table. I think it was lunchtime or something. And we were doing what kids, a lot of kids do. What did you have for dinner last night? And it was the 80s. So it was still OK to say, what did your mom make for dinner last night? And they were going around the table, and one of them was like, oh, steak and potatoes. One of them was pot roast. One of them, spaghetti and meatballs. One of them was like, ribs and corn on the cob. And it came to my turn. And I said, we had pork hearts with rice and beans and bananas. And everybody went, eh! <laughs> and I was like, we don't, what, what? Like, we don't always eat pork hearts just when they're on at the store. But, I mean, we have rice and beans with bananas every night. And I was generally confused. And then obviously the kids made fun of me for the rest of that year. I was the kid that ate pig heart. 
and it's funny because we were all white American people, and yet my whiteness somehow did not protect me from all of this microaggressive racism. It's, it's so funny because just on Thursday, I had lunch with a bunch of white farmers from up in Wyoming and Park City area, and they all just got to talking about eating all sorts of weird parts of cows and chickens and horses and, and goats and stuff that they've experienced in their lives. But my work announced that they're going to re-implement Taco Tuesday for the first time in two years. And I was sitting in that room and I, my eyes just jetted over to a couple educated white women. <laughs> <to see their faces. laughs> and I was like, you, you better not jump in, but luxury belief is the missionaries over and over again, going to all these towns, mm. a gazillion, like Chile alone has what, 10 missions in just one country. Oh, right. Not super racist. Yeah. The yeah race, super, they we're real racist. Super racist 10 in Chile. Right. Like most people recognize who the missionaries are now. It's plowed territory. Yeah. Africa's mm. unplowed territory because we weren't investing in it because we were super racist. <laughs> so that's part of <laughs> So what, what, oh, okay. what is colonialism if not an investment in Africa? <laughs> That's what so it is. Stupid. That's what colonialism is. Of <laughs> why I think Africans, it's like, whoa, who are these people? But then the more darker, sinister part is did it again. Oh, darker, did it. darker, dark means sinister. Is those synonyms? <laughs> and this is sensitive, but this is what I experienced in my mission. You're, you're, um, in a developing country. You don't have, you don't have cement floors. You don't have indoor plumbing. You might not have electricity. You might these not are have racist, food. Colonialist assumptions. Yeah, <laughs> there are. And then these six foot six blonde haired, blue eyed Americans show up in white shirts and ties with suits. <laughs> like assholes. How dare they have that hair color, skin tone and dress sense. <laughs> and all monsters. That. All the natives say, oh, it's get up gone. Oh, <laughs> little Pueblo or into your little village. <laughs> and they've got money and good teeth and they're tall. And the they don't have money, John. <laughs> I don't know if you remember being a missionary. We didn't have money. We looked <laughs> like people who might have money, understandably, to the locals. So, but he's also talking about this in a way like the Book of Mormon musical, which came out, what, 10 years ago, had already advanced beyond this, that the Africans look at those Mormons like, what is wrong with you goofs? You're out of it. And I believe that in 1978, God changed his mind about black people. Black people, you can be a Mormon, a Mormon who just believes. What the f*** is this? sharing my faith with you the scriptures say that if you ask in faith if you ask god himself you'll know but you must ask him without any doubt and let your spirit He's still describing him like, oh, it's, it's Hernan Cortez. It looks like Jesus. It looks like a white God. You know, he's still describing it like they're, they're some isolated tribe that has never seen white people in ties before. Have you ever heard the song Coffee Cola song by Francis Bebe? It's no. like from 1980. It's, it's a wonderful song. It's by a guy who was a, a Cameroonian French composer who was a pioneer of early African electro pop. But there's this great song called the Coffee Cola Song. 
And the song is sung from the perspective of pygmies looking at the city dwellers. And we're talking about black Africans talking about black Africans. And the song is delightful and, and it's wonderful and everybody should look it up. It's, it's, I, I think it's great. But it's just that, like that's 40 years old now and in John DeLynn's world doesn't exist. There are people in town, man, crazy people in town, eating bread and butter and honey and drinking black coffee cola. They believe we are wild, man. They believe we are wild. Just because we don't use any money and we drink no coffee cola. But if you could go and see how they live. Then you discover how savage they are, so much wilder than we. Yeah, it's wonderful. And it's and it's basically it's about how rural pygmies look at the city dwelling Africans and say, What's up with you guys? And it's and it's 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 a critique of capitalism, it's a critique of money. Because you know, the whole thing is like, oh, you guys just fight all the time for what? So you can afford to put to drink coffee cola, which apparently is a drink, literally coffee and cola. Um yeah. Yeah, and Rose. He's acting like most of the people <laughs> these missionaries are coming around and talking to don't already also have iPhones. Yeah. You know? <laughs> but yeah, exactly. But he had like John DeLynn is the guy who's saying Africans are too dumb to know what's up with American missionaries. As if because yeah, like yeah, he's Africans, he's still thinking white, it's the frontier. He's still Africa thinking it's eighteen hundreds, seventeen hundreds colonialism. It's also funny of him talking about Africa and saying like they come into your pueblo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think you he meant teepee. He's, he's like, what are the poor? People. What do the poor races do? Hmm. <laughs> what What do the no concrete people think of white shirts? <laughs> Most of those countries already been colonialized. Yeah. No, and also like you know, every one of those shithole countries is run by a local African. War not Lord. not an evil Belgian. I mean, but that's what I said. Ten years ago, the Book of Mormon musical got that right already. They were already it already showed you that the missionaries were coming in, loo, 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 and they were very much more of the rough, rough real world in Africa. It's not what it's not what the Lynn thinks it is here. They're educated, and they show up in your town. What does that do to the mind of somebody who like literally has no shoes? They're wearing a t-shirt of the non-winner of the Super Bowl that says they won the Super Bowl. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but one of my favorite examples, I, I swear to God, I saw this, that I would see those rejected shirts with just weird sayings. <laughs> one of the ones, the, the one that I saw, I don't know what it was trying to say, but it, it had boner champ written on it and it was like this 14 year old girl just walking around and said boner that's what he's, i mean they're thinking so hard that they're gonna walk up to people with bones in their noses or something like that come on <laughs> indoor plumbing no indoor water what a, i mean this is probably sensitive territory but <laughs> I think yeah, it's probably. relevant yeah what do you I don't mean to like plant, yeah, well, plant it's your called, answer. It's called, uh, answer for the non-whites, brown bad. I, I know he's uh, he's Gerardo's just looking at him like, what the hell do you want from me? You didn't even ask a question. Like you didn't. The, the only thing he said was, he's like, what does it do to them when they see white people? And Gerardo's like, I don't know. There's a lot of white people in Mexico, man. What do you want from me? And Val please validate my misconceptions, other person. <laughs> What's the solution? Just don't ever expose them to white people? Are we against like ethnic diversity now? Is that what is happening? You yeah. must go there and you must give them all your money and you must give them all the things. You must not go there and you must not give them all your money. You must not. There, there really was that stuff. And maybe I could clip it in or something here. But over the years, they've covered a lot of different uh, amnesty and nationals and all these things. That these people go and try to do old timey missionary stuff or or even from the BBC and they go and try to take money in these villages and they catch hell from people on the internet for trying to take anything over to Africa or to give any sort of aid or anything like that because it's colonialism. But then if they don't, they catch hell for it. I mean, it's truly the biggest heads I win, tells you lose thing yeah. on, on earth. Well, I mean, all of this is summarized by um, when Thomas Sowell says, I can't remember exactly, but he said, multiculturalism is very simply 
you can only criticize Western culture. You cannot criticize non-Western culture. Yeah. And so if they're Those helping the or rules. not helping, they're not helping. Colonizing, for sure. In what way? I agree. Well, you're coming from a place of, of like, of privilege to a uh, unprivileged people, and they're obviously going to accept whatever you tell them, right? Why? What? See why? Well, it's going back to that that Francis Bebe song because in the song, the singer is from the perspective of the backward rural village dwellers, but they're saying we are the privileged people because we just live in our village and we're happy and we sing and dance and our and our community is tight. Whereas you are in the city dealing with all of this money and coffee and cola and fancy stuff and wars. Like it's totally reversed. But because well, John Delip is a racist, we just saw Matt <laughs> We just saw Matt Walsh try to tell a tribe that that hey, you know, women can have penises and they don't just accept what you tell them, you know. Yeah. No, a well, rich, that, white, a well dressed white man has come to our village. We must all listen. <laughs> no, well, they, are, they laugh are they, at him. I thought the privilege was based on like power dynamics. And so if I were to go to like a sub a sub Saharan African nation I'd be like the only white guy there, and therefore, would would I still be privileged? Like I understand they'll try to justify calling me the privileged one in that situation anyway, but I, I feel like that I, yeah. I, I shouldn't be the privileged one there. What? They'll, they'll also, call there's a, there's a they'll that's call that's everybody true. else the minority still. <laughs> I know it's, it's... <laughs> look. And, and I'm in a nation of minorities. <laughs> the other thing that also like it keeps coming up, but it's, it's like it's unspoken. They keep dancing around it, and they won't say it. Because you know, because we, we are talking about sub-Saharan African here. Well, what what's the rest of Africa? <laughs> well, that's the Maghreb. That's Muslim Africa. There, there's not even a question of like, why aren't the Mormons going to Muslim Africa? Like, why no. aren't they up there? In the, you know, why aren't they in Egypt? How many yeah, Egyptian exactly. African, I mean, missionaries have you noticed? But yeah, how many missionaries have been to Libya in the last twenty-five years? <laughs> we also we started this podcast clip off of showing this one where this one guy was talking to them about his super privileged upbringing, and then he still ended up having scrupulosity and having an eating disorder and having an overworking disorder be, because somebody said to him, "Oh, I see you lost your baby weight over the summer or something like that," and they're all empathetic with him of having an extremely difficult internal life after having a paradise of an upbringing, but he still got up in his head about little details and little things. And they're obviously not going to allow for that type of internal strife and internal anxiety disorders when it comes to now we're talking about this. And I, and I mentioned Jared that I think even these types of psychologists might, well, I mean, I've seen John do it. I could probably clip it in right here too, where he said to that girl who was a, uh, that there was a girl who said she'd been sexually assaulted and he stopped and said to her, but you need to recognize your privilege. You need to recognize yeah. that you, you didn't have it as good as some other people. He even encouraged that I go to a um, non-Mormon therapist. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Another lottery. Major lottery. <laughs> win. Major Another lottery. Another lottery win you, you had. Yeah. And I think that's one of the reasons why I feel so important for speaking my story is because I've had... I'm in a situation because I won the There's lottery privilege. and a couple There's things. There's a there. lot of privilege. It's weird story. to talk about privilege because you were a victim, but, but, but I just do. just this idea of like most Orthodox Mormon therapists are going to say atonement, atonement, believe in Jesus, yeah. draw cl close to Jesus, trust Jesus, He'll wipe it all clean and He'll forgive you and He'll yeah. forgive if, if there's anything you've done, He'll forgive you and He'll forgive your dad, and the blood of Jesus's atonement will wipe it all clean. Yes. Right. Yeah. So no, and that I, I've i never put it in that way that I have privilege in my story, but I have it's twisted. immense privilege in my story. I'm sure that they do the same thing to any sort of privileged person who's struggling with their internal life that you got to stop and remind you that you didn't have it as good as a sub-Saharan Africa. Well, like I already find it, you know, pretty insulting when I'm told I'm privileged all the time. I can't imagine how insulting it would be to like be the like a white trash Appalachia kid that grew up without a dad and like had his teeth rotting out by the time he was eight years old because all he survived on was Mountain Dew. Be told like 
you are more privileged like because of your skin color <laughs> it's outrageous when they do it that way but then it's also outrageous on the flip end of that that yeah all sorts of depression and suicidal ideation in this world comes from a place of saying i do have everything why am i not happy you know yeah. and and then they're just going to poke at that and jab at that every single ounce of it all just has backwards cognitive dissonance to it that i don't yeah. even know how to straighten them out i don't you know well just the like, as far as we can tell, like the more liberal a place you live, the higher the rate that LGBT kids kill themselves. We, we're mm -hmm. not seeing it in North Korea and in Egypt and in Oman. You know, it's, it's kind of like, yeah, there's just that. There's that paradox. And, you know, because I think it's like, no, I think it's you're the one that is making the people, kids feel bad when you tell them, oh, hey, bad news, little gay kid. The whole world is stacked against you when you will never be happy. You know, your parents like will never, Japan, never accept you. They, yeah. You know, like you, you're just closeted and, and you keep it under your hat. Like, you know, like the way a million people have parts of their lives they have to keep secret because they're not totally socially acceptable, but there are always those spaces. Yeah. But yeah, just that. It's, well, they panic. They start, they seriously start to panic these woke types. If, if somebody who is a minority, somebody who is oppressed, starts to think that they're not oppressed they panic i found this video this dude does he's a teacher he gives this ted talk based ted type talk where he, he's talking about doing the privilege walk where you got you know all your kids start oh, yeah. at the line they I'll clip in your yeah. i'll clip in your video here for a minute now if you haven't had the good fortune to come across uh, the, the concept of a privilege walk well he's about to explain what a privilege walk is to you keep in mind he is a teacher so, in the beginning of the year, I did what most well-meaning, social justice-driven teachers would do, and we did a privilege walk. First, I gotta point out, why the hell are there social justice-driven teachers? First, you co-opted the phrase social justice to be only yours and all yours. Now you gotta, you gotta make your teachers be those goddamn preachers of social justice. My hope was to showcase to my students the invisible and, to be honest, unearned disadvantages they have simply by being a minoritized person in our world. So, one brisk December morning, I ran with about 121 of my students, around 20 staff members, and we went outside to do the walk. As soon as they were lined up side by side, I began to read the statements aloud. Take a step forward if one of your parents has attended college. Up stepped a few of my students, and a handful more, and a couple more. I thought to myself, hmm, that's interesting. Okay. Oh shit, this isn't working the way I wanted it to. If one of your parents owns a business, and yet a few more students step forward, and see, at this point in time, my plan began to crumble before my eyes. Chat, 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 chat. Right. So I said another statement. Take a step backwards if your race can be used against you to explain your faults. Not a student of color moved. Oh my God, no, 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 no. Oh my God, no. The black kids in my class don't know that they're oppressed. They're not afraid of, of every part of the world around them. What am I going to do? I've failed as a teacher. I have failed these students because they are not paranoid. This is the funniest shit ever to me. Because he asked these kids, these students of color, these black kids, oh, does your race do have hold anything negative against you? They're like, mm, nah. And he's like, oh shit, how do I teach them that, that their race does? <laughs> how do I change their minds on this? Mm. Okay, and, and he gets eventually the he has some of the white kids like behind some of the black kids they saying that oh sh shit they're they these black kids think that they're not oppressed i have to so i had to reframe the way i do this to let them to, see that they really to let are them oppressed. know that they're oppressed it was it scared the hell out of me that for a second they thought life was good yeah jared's <laughs> video on that's really good his uh, his channel is saint the pyre um what were you gonna say about gerardo oh this part's just funny to me because like I got Matt Gerardo. He's he's a nice dude, but yeah, he's right here, nice he's just like racking his brain for like, what the hell do you want from me, John? <laughs> so he kind of <laughs> just starts throwing out like, uh, I, it's colonialism, I guess, dude. What what are you looking for? <laughs> it's yeah. like, do you know how many kids are sitting in classes around the U.S. right now doing that same thing? Colonialism. Uh, That's right. <laughs> no. oh, oh, a for a for me today. <laughs> yeah, no, well, it's, it's exactly like Sunday school. school. In classes, though, the vagueness is intentional. Here, John just doesn't know how to speak, <laughs> yeah. I guess. Uh, not necessarily because it's true or good or 
uh, it's necessarily going to benefit them just because they're seeing you as a as like a higher authority because of your position of privilege. Yeah, it's like, will they teach me English? That might help me get ahead. Will they give me money? That might help me feed my family. Will they potentially, uh, can I marry one of them? Maybe that would get me to the United States. That, that <laughs> sounds like those guys are being manipulative, not the, not the elders. No, I know. It's like, why is that a bad thing? You just, oh, man, they come at it from, are these people going to do nice things for me? So you better material, not do the nice things for them. They're material opportunists. Is that what you're saying, John? So here we go, John, you fucking jackass. I just Googled <laughs> English-speaking countries in Africa. There are about 6.5 million native English speakers and around 700 million non-native English speakers in Africa. Sierra Leone and Liberia are the only countries in Africa where English is spoken as the primary language. English is the primary language of Nigeria and Ghana, but the language is spoken as a lingua franca in both states. The largest English speaking in countries in Africa are Nigeria, 198 million, Ethiopia, 110 million, South Africa, 58 million, Tanzania, 60 million, Kenya, 50 million. <laughs> like, English is everywhere in Africa, you fucking moron. Well, it's advantageous to learn English. It's just like, and why would that be a, a bad thing? Like, they're going to see it and, oh, these people can teach me English. Yeah, that's good. Like, the, like why would you not, in, in your desire for multiculturalism, why would you not want people teaching each other languages? That's just a good thing. More people can communicate. The whole ultimate point of the, these wackadoos who are going to religions and trying to push in liberation theology into the religions is they want those religions to become more material givers. Like, stop trying to give soul stuff. Stop trying to do that. Give materialism. Give them materialism. That is the concept of liberation theology. And then people are trying to push it in the Mormon church as much as anywhere. So if you are into that whole world, you should be into the concept that they're bringing wealth to those people in some sort of way. Although I think it's yeah, all stupid. See. What? It's, or will they? Yeah, there's a whole list here of the English speakers in every country in africa and just like yeah john you just don't know what you're talking about they help me get a visa so that i can get out of this place and actually go support get food and shelter there's yeah, a power john. differential i think um, that's really what's that mr colonialist I... you're gonna go <laughs> save the savages from their own culture oh you're <laughs> saying that africans don't want to be in africa they didn't gonna... have food they're going to get oh, married for right. a green card and come over here and dick our dabs. You never get here, Jen. And they also, with the Pathways program um, and education, mm -hmm. they also are promised that if they serve a mission, they can go to the Pathways program. They can do the wow, online that's schooling terrible. through the church. Get an education. Yeah, get an education, which I think is huge Those to monsters. a lot of them. So that's, there's that. And that's well, hard because it was non English speaking African child. Would you like to exchange work for an education? <laughs> like, what a monstrous, evil colonialist deal that is. <laughs> yeah, what the hell? They're, they're naming with... only good things. And I feel bad for everybody in this room because it wasn't just Gerardo, it's everybody has the same look on their face. Like, where the hell is this guy going? <laughs> what am yeah, I supposed but, to say? But I, I think he is putting an essence of the cognitive dissonance that's there for this whole entire critique the West world. I mean, they, they, yeah. they're all upside down in this. With getting an education right. or learning English or learning some of the church's morals and values. Like, I'm not saying people don't have sex with toads. People in developing <laughs> countries don't benefit from joining the Mormon church. I think many- How, about, how about the value, how about the value that says, raping an infant will not cure AIDS? Yeah, I was gonna say, I said that back, backwards. The uh, Book of Mormon <laughs> musical is have sex with a toad instead. That's the- uh... And then Joseph yeah. Smith fucked Brigham Young clit face with his fuck toad. <laughs> that, was a, that was one of the. I don't understand how the Book of Mormon musical hasn't been like. It's got to oh, be an area of cognitive dissonance. It has been canceled. It's been canceled. Like the, it would be a movie already, but they had to backtrack the movie because it's too un PC now. Now we'll probably well, never get how, a movie. Like, why? Wait, I'm going to post about this in an ex Mormon site, like posing as a wokester because, like, I think even the original Elder Cunningham, that Josh Gad dude, is, is denounced it too, or said it was insensitive or something like that. But, I, I mean, it's troubling. But the, but the whole point of the entire satire of the entire thing is to point out the, well, 
But it's to, it's to point out you're not actually giving us relevant answers. <laughs> like, yeah, you're not giving us well, but then they give pragmatic answers, uh, and that's kind of maybe where religion comes from. That's the whole point of the thing. Is like, so he, the guy started fudging and getting fudgy with stuff, but his his fudginess gave them a pragmatic answer: have sex with the toads instead of the babies. Yeah, and, I know. And it, <laughs> it's like, what does your book say about raping virgins to cure AIDS? <laughs> it doesn't say anything. <laughs> Although I feel and like dude, if you were just, to get morals from the Mormon church, it should be, you should pretty clearly glean from their morals that you shouldn't rape babies. Because they get yeah. a set of moral standards, a community, a set of beliefs, a sense of meaning and purpose, identity. It's horrible. He's really so selling me on the Mormon church here. <laughs> complicated. It is complicated too, because in a way, I think Man, where's that money that line? Those are this is clip all I our things that we're placing onto them. Like it's cultural what, imperialism. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. Like <laughs> they could be Yes, that's what you're engaged in right now, John. It's called exactly cultural imperialism. Happy and content and so many people pointed out that these woke woke ideas are absolutely a type of colonialism that they go around pushing it into the yeah. entire world. Stay um, in the Pueblo. <laughs> not needing of any yeah, of those things. Pueblo. And just want to live with their family Where the way they line? are and be 100% happy and content. And the church in its station of uh, privilege is coming in and saying our way is better. And this is like Miss America answering a question. What, and what, what, they, so, so the church from their place of privilege. What do they mean by that even? Because like, when did the church become a privileged church? Because for a long time, Mormons were not widely accepted in broader American society. It's been mostly a product of like, you know, probably our parents' generation is when it started being less, you know, like, I mean, because before that, Mormons were pretty insular. The church is so, a white man, know. so obviously it's privileged. Oh, that's right. Mm. That, they don't, they don't know that. Um, they're not going in, Where is the I think, for, like, to learn from them, to, you know, embrace their culture, to um, listen, to really see them, and then make you got decision, sped up. how can we help? How, how could we help? Like, that's how I picture Christ going into the, their country. That. They're just, this is the way it's going to be. Let me put that over you, and let me tell you all the good things without telling you all the everything and not that's like wrong. jesus do that. jesus yeah. didn't have any prescriptive yeah. ideas it's about like... how society should act no <laughs> i love the lefty co-opting of of jesus in everything like jesus is just perfectly empathetic he was like there was a verse somewhere where he's like totally cool with transgenderism he's like all this stuff jesus also he was a socialist just so you know yeah, yeah. it turns out jesus theology. i don't believe in jesus but he he actually was exactly me Every one of my I think Robert so Price says all the time that he, what he hates more than anything is is people who use the Bible as a ventriloquist dummy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They're an abomination. The way you dress needs to change. Learn our language if you can. Adopt our ways. Adopt our. Stop drinking the drinks that are native to your culture. You know, change your change your like, food. Like change the your... urine of cows. <laughs> this is what stop drinking that. Are they looking I know, for like I know you have the thousands of years of culture that says that that's medicine, but you just... this is what happens when the Mormon goes to college. You know, the, <laughs> the exact same pressure gets put on them. Some young Mormon kid from the rural parts who doesn't know your ways of you of you smart whites. Well, does gets... he want does he want the church to engage in cultural relativism or in, in moral relativism here? Because if it's they change the I'm rules based that. on the culture, then like he would be criticizing them. Like, if I pointed out to him that one of the weird things to me when I was on my mission is that I spent a little bit of time in Nebraska because I was waiting for my visa. And the, the Word of Wisdom pamphlet, when I was in Nebraska, it had the five things we're not allowed to partake of. And one of them, it, it said tea. And then I got to Brazil, and the same pamphlet said black tea, like specified black tea. And I, was, I thought that was odd. And I asked one of my companions about it, like, well, they really like tea here. And I was like, isn't... Or, but, but if it's bad, it's bad. Like, if God says it's bad, and and that's so that's something I would criticize the church for, is if your culture says that oh beer is sacred, and they were to say well okay don't don't 
you guys can drink beer. These guys can drink beer. Then John DeLynn would be criticizing that. So he's like actively calling for something that I know for a fact he would criticize if they listened to it. If him. they did, if they were relativistic. But that's when where they get were, it. That's where they get when it. When you right were missionarying here. in, in Rio Grande do Sul, were you as a missionary or did any missionaries ever drink machi? All the time. Every day. Because that's because machi is that's what's going on there with the whole tea thing. Because machi it's related to caffeine, the mataina, whatever it is. But so yeah, I wonder because like I've heard so many different stories about like because some Brazilian missions, like the mission president would say, No, you are not allowed to drink machi, that counts as tea. But then well, you know, I hear this other thing. Because like when I was a missionary in California just 21 years ago, I had a convert, a guy I baptized was an older guy. And he got special permission that he had to get from the bishop to drink decaffeinated coffee. Because they, because that decaffeinated coffee was still out. But this guy, like, it was a, it, it was the only way he would get baptized. He's like, I'm, I'm not, I'm not dropping coffee. I'll do decaf. And they let him do it. That's but, weird. So, so, they like, had, so you drink matcha. It wasn't like, no, no, it wasn't a thing. No, it was do. in like the neighboring, because I was in Porto Alegre Sul mission. And then I, I know that the Santa Maria mission right next to us was, they weren't allowed to, the missionaries weren't allowed to. But when I got there, I didn't know what it was. And I, my first word, a bishop was drinking it on the stand yeah. and they got it everywhere <laughs> there. And it's, it's actually, I, I thought the mission presidents who didn't allow us to drink it would have been really stupid because like. I drank it. You, you go to someone's house and teach him and they pass around the kuya and you just, it, you're, a, yeah. you're a dick if you don't drink it. Yeah, it's, so. it's weird. It's weird that you don't <laughs> drink it. People are suspicious of you. Like, what yeah. the hell's wrong with you? Yeah. And who doesn't like hot lawn clipping tea? You know, I got to the point where I liked it. That's I, I, I know. Was... I love it. I grew up, I grew up with it and I love it, but it does taste like hot hot lawn that's exactly how i describe it to everybody it, it tastes like <laughs> grass water and but i love it <laughs> it's wonderful change your beliefs change your spirituality get rid of your plural wives yeah get rid, because we're rich and wealthy and powerful exactly. uh her, let's get you in here rfm do you think we're do you think this cultural imperialism wives. point and this even colonialism point is is important here when we talk about the growth in africa well, even when you don't call on me, I'll intrude myself one way or another. All right. I think that, uh, yeah. by the way, that wasn't a joke when I said get rid of your plural wives. Right. Right. Yeah. This is one of the great ironies in a church riddled with ironies is that they go to Africa. You guys have all the same irony. You guys have yeah. all the same double standards or the same back and forth. Okay. And that's the Where money shot I've been trying to get to. Have more than one wife and it's accepted and it's legal. It's just not Mormon anymore. And so one of the conditions of being baptized is that if a man has more than one wife, he has to get rid of all of them except for the one he wants to keep. So in this scenario, it's evil, right? I'm guessing. I see. I, that's not, the thing I was going to say. I took, that to as, I took that as almost a dig from RFM. Like he's, he's saying, well, there's some things about this culture that maybe... I perceive as negative. I don't know. Maybe I give RFM too much credit. But I perceive a lot of what he does as being just a very tiny bit of a dig. Yeah. Well, yeah. the other thing, like if I if I if I was in the room, I would like to ask John Delin right there. Is like because because we already know we know because we've heard you talk that Mormon polygamy is born out of misogyny. Is African polygamy also misogyny? Why or why not? Well, Obviously, maybe, I'll but misogyny, misogyny might be part of their culture, and, and you as a Western oh. <laughs> white adjacent man cannot be critical of their culture. I bet you there's a PhD for both sides of that. <laughs> <laughs> Working in the same college. Working in the same department. So maybe right there, I know that you, Jared, you got a heart out at two. I don't know if you keep going. I don't know how long Flip has, but maybe I could cut this into episodes and now we'll do the sex pride one. Go um, for it. Because I definitely want to get to the point where I was very proud of my moment where I came yeah, out. Yeah, we want to hit that. But I'm thinking that one got long enough. We ended up just covering mostly that race thing. And that, uh, man, that one little clip, we got a dang hour out of that one little clip. And, and it was all <laughs> worth commenting on. And I don't want to cut it down very much. So maybe I'll cut that one in half. And now we'll roll. Part it. two. Part two, we're going to talk about pride.